Hello and welcome to Noon Conference hosted by MRI Online. Noon Conference connects the global radiology community through free live educational webinars that are accessible for all and is an opportunity to learn alongside top radiologists from around the world. We encourage you to ask questions and share ideas to help the community learn and grow. You can access the recording of today's conference and previous Noon Conferences by creating a free MRI Online account. Today, we are honored to welcome back to the Noon Conference stage, Dr. Samir Raniga for a lecture entitled Thoracolumbar Spine Injury at CT, A Systematic Search Pattern. Dr. Raniga serves as a staff radiologist at University Hospital in Muscat, Oman, and is a dedicated faculty member in the radiology residency training program. With an interest in various subspecialties, he blends his clinical skills with a strong interest in medical education. He's involved in teaching medical students, residents, fel fellows, and practicing radiologists in India and Oman, and participating in international educational programs. He's a member of the Annual Meeting Program Planning Committee for RSNA for the Emergency Radiology Subspecialty, and a reviewer of the educational exhibits for RSNA. We're glad he's here today to share his expertise. At the end of this lecture, please join him in a Q&A session where he will address questions you may have on today's topic. Please remember to use the Q&A feature to submit your questions so we can get to as many as we can before our time is up. With that, we are ready to begin today's lecture. Dr. Raniga, please take it from here. Thank you, Ashley, for this invitation and uh, for the introduction. Uh, I'm Samir Raniga. I work uh, at the University Hospital, Makkat, Oman. Uh, it's evening in Oman, 8 p.m., so good evening to all of you from different time zones. And uh, well, uh, the noon conference of MRI um, is one of the best uh, online accessible uh, uh, resource available uh, uh, during the pandemic and after the pandemic. And uh, I would like to thank MRI online for stepping up during the pandemic to make this radiology education accessible to all. Uh, this is my second noon conference. Uh, the first one I gave in 2021 uh, and uh, uh, in next 45 or 50 minutes, we are going to learn about the role of imaging in thoracolumbar spine trauma assessment with emphasis on CT and systematic search pattern. Uh, I do not have any conflict of interest to disclose. Um, the, the, some of the amazing illustrations which I'll be going to use in this presentation were prepared by Matt Skalski. Uh, uh, Matt is a, is a, um, uh, we collaborated on several projects, but uh, the, the article which we published in 2016, uh, Radiographics, uh, Matt uh, uh, prepared this uh, uh, some of the illustrations and we are going to use it. Uh, there'll be few abbreviations which I'll be using uh, during my presentation. So uh, motor vehicle collision and fall from height are some of the commonest mechanism for the thoracolumbar spine trauma and fractures. And almost two third of the spine fractures occur in this region. Among thoracic and lumbar region, the T2 to T10 is relatively uncommon fracture. Majority of fractures occur between T10 and L2 because this thoracolumbar junction is biomechanically transitional zone and susceptible zone to fractures. Lumbosacral spine is relatively less commonly involved. These fractures are important because up to one third of these fractures result in neurologic injury, some form of at least 30% of the fractures are associated with some form of abdominal or other associated injuries. 15% of the fractures are non-contiguous fractures so that when you see fracture in cervical or lumbar spine, there is possibility that the fracture other spine is also involved in at least one in eight patients. And quite often these fractures are delayed in diagnosis or they are missed completely altogether. So, in this presentation, what we are going to do is uh, my learning objective is to use the CT search pattern to detect the fractures. Once fracture is detected, how to describe it using the terms which are understandable by our surgical team. And we use the uniform same terms. We'll learn how to discriminate different similar looking injuries on imaging, particularly with the CT scan, and how not to miss these fractures on imaging. At last, we will understand that how this information is useful to our treating trauma surgeons to decide which patient will go to operating room vis-a-vis -vis which patients will go for non-operative management. So this is the outline of my talk. I'll start with some of the concepts important for spine trauma. 
then we will understand how to approach a CT using a systematic search pattern. I will show you plenty of cases and examples, some spot images and some stack of images to, to, to show the pattern recognition we are going to learn during this presentation. And last but not the least, throughout this presentation, I'll show you or I will share a lot of practical tips which will be useful in day-to-day -day reporting. So as far as concepts are concerned, we'll learn about three important issues, the anatomy and biomechanics, the imaging appropriateness and spine trauma, and fracture morphology and the classification. So quickly understand uh, the biomechanics and anatomy of the spine relevant to the spine trauma. And this is what is described as the motion segment of the spine, which is a basic motion unit of the spine, and it's the smallest functional unit. The spinal column can be divided into anterior and posterior column. Anterior column is vertebral body, ALL, the disc, and the PLL. The posterior column is neural arch and all the ligaments which connects the neural arch, which is called posterior ligamentous complex. The posterior tension bend is important to understand, and posterior tension bend consists of neural arch, which are the bony structures, which includes pedicle, superior and inferior articular facet, the lamina, the spinous process, the facet joints, and the transverse processes. The ligament which connects these different structures from cranial to caudally it constitute what is known as posterior ligamentous complex or PLC. And they include the facet joints, interspinous ligament, supraspinous ligament, and ligamentum flavor. So all of these four ligaments together are called, are, are called the posterior ligament complex. So as we can see, the supraspinous ligament connects the tip of the spinous processes the interspinous ligament connects the adjacent spinous processes. The ligamentum flavum connects the lamina to the upper and the lower vertebral body contiguously, and they are seen in continuation with the interspinous ligament. And facet joint capsules strengthen the facet joint. All of these ligaments are very critical in restraining the translation, rotation, and flexion moment. And this is the main component of the tension bend working like a cable in a lifting crane. When it comes to imaging appropriateness, CT is often used as a first-line imaging in all high-velocity trauma. Radiographs are used as a screening modality in low-risk low patients. However, any abnormality you see on radiographs or even suspicious abnormality on radiographs, CT should be done as the next imaging. And even when radiographs is normal, if clinical suspicion is high for spine trauma, the CT should be done in this patient as well. MRI is complementary to CT in high-risk patients. MRI is the imaging modality of choice if X-rays are normal or X-ray shows osteoporotic compression factor. And any patient who has a neurologically positive tra spine trauma, MRI is something which is done in all the patients. As far as the classification of the spine trauma is concerned, the whole idea of classifying the spine trauma is to unify the description of the injury between the radiologist and the referring team to decide whether the spine trauma is stable or unstable based on the degree of the injury that happens. And last but not the least is that any spine trauma classification should guide the treatment and it should improve the outcome if it's appropriately used. So all the spine trauma classifications which are used historically, all of them are imaging based. Earlier it was based on radiographs and later on they are based on the CT scan. The so early classification system were more qualitative and mechanistic, mechanistic. That means they are pattern based, which describes the fracture morphology and different patterns which we are going to learn. Injury mechanisms like flexion, like rotation, like uh, distraction, so and so forth. And last is instability, whether the fracture pattern which is seen on the X-ray or a CT scan will result in instability or not. The recent classification system are more numeric. They are based on the fracture pattern severity plus soft tissue injuries as can be determined on CT or MR along with the presence or absence of the neurological symptoms. So if you start from the beginning, it started with 1932 Bowler and then the Watson gave in 1938, Nicole in 1949. But one of the most important classification was given in 1963 by Holdsworth. At that time, only X-rays were available. And he described the spine consists of a vertical two column. The anterior column is vertebral body, disc, and the ALLPLL. The posterior column was the neural arch and the posterior ligamentous complex. He was the first guy who came up with that posterior ligaments are important tension bend. 
Then Dennis in 1983 came up with the three column classification. He divided the entire column into interior and middle column. Then McAfee in 83 came up with another classification. The medal classification was the original OA classification which, was, which came in 1995, which was one of very difficult classification to use. And so Wokero in 2005 came up with the Stilic classification which he himself updated the OA in 2030. So let's understand the three column concept of Dennis, which is very important to understand and still makes a good portion of many classification system which we use. So Dennis divided the anterior column of the Holdsworth into two parts. So the anterior column can be divided into anterior and the middle column. Anterior column consists of the anterior two-third of the vertebral body, anterior two-third of the disc, and the ALL. The middle column consists of the posterior one-third of the vertebral body, posterior one-third of the disc, and the PLL. And everything behind the PLL was the posterior column. What Dennis believed that the middle column is very important in the stability, and he, he proposed that fracture or injury of any two contiguous column will result in the instability of the spine. So either anterior and middle column fails, that will result in unstable spine. Or if middle or posterior column will fail, it results in the unstable spine. Of course, if all the three columns are injured, it will definitely result in unstable spine. And as we will learn a little bit later on, all of this instable or unstable spine needs some form of surgical correction in order to make the spine stable again. McAfee, McAfee in 1983 came up with this classification, which was based on the pattern. And he used some of the descriptive terms like wedge compression, stable burst, unstable burst, flexion, distraction, chance, translation, so on and so forth. However, in current time, two most widely used classification system, both of them were proposed by the Vaccaro et al. In 2005, the spine trauma group came up with CLICS, which is the historical lumbar injury classification system, which is based on the fracture morphology and the neurology. And this classification was point-based and it determines what will be the treatment of these fractures. In 2013, the same group uh, along with the OA modified the AO classification and that is what is called the updated AO classification or AO TLIX classification, which again is based on the morphology, which is simplified clinical behavior and some of the modifier as we will learn detail in the next few slides. So in TLIX classification, injury morphology can be of four types. Compression injury will get one point, burst injury will get two points, rotation or translation injuries will get three points and distraction injuries will get four points. TLIX is the first group which comes up with the importance of the posterior tension bend and they say that if posterior ligament is complex is injured that will get an additional three points if the posterior ligament is complex is intact that will be zero point and if it's indeterminate it will get two points if you total the morphology points and the t and the and the p plc integrity point you will come up with a score so if the score is less than four, that means one, two, three, these patients are operated non-operatively. They are not operated, they are conservatively treated. If the score is more than four, these patients are surgically treated because those spines are unstable. However, if the point score is exactly four, then the choice to treat by surgery or by non-operative is based on the surgeon, for surgeon's own choice. In 2013, the updated AO classification again has similar morphology of injury. So in compression injury, it's called A type of injury. It involves primarily the anterior column. That means the, the anterior plus middle column. And it has total five types, A0 to A4. A0, A1, and A2 are compression fractures. A3 and A4 are different types of burst fractures. So compression plus burst, all of them comes under the group A. The distraction injuries or the B injuries, which primarily involve the flexion tension bend or extension tension bend, most of the patients, their distraction injury occurs in the flexion bend, which is the posterior ligament complex or the posterior tension bend. And there are three types. B1 and B2 involves the posterior group and B3 involves the anterior group. The anterior tension bend injuries are extremely rare in the absence of the fused or ankylosed spine. 
So we will not go into detail of the B3. However, B1 and B2 are very, very important injuries, which we'll learn. And last but not the least is the translation injuries when one vertebral body moves in relation to the other vertebral body. And that is called C type of injury. And there is one C type. So either translation is present or absent. So A and B1 injuries are single level injury are called monoostotic injuries, while B2 and C are adjacent level injuries. <clears throat> So what we will do today is we will try to learn the basic principles of systematic search pattern on CT without going into the detail of this classification. However, this morphology, what we will learn, will help us to use any of the classification system your surgeons are using. So based on the morphology, so fracture morphology depends upon the failure mode of the spinal column. And fracture morphology can be compression fracture, which primarily involves the anterior columns. Burst fracture, which involves anterior plus middle column. Distraction injury, it is a tension bend injury. It can involve posterior tension bend or anterior tension bend. As I told you that the anterior tension bend injuries are extremely rare, only seen in patients who have entylos with the fused spine. So majority of the tension bend injury you will see in your practice involves the posterior tension bend, which is called distraction injury. And last but not the least is the translation injuries where all three columns, anterior, middle and posterior columns are involved. So basically, at the end of this presentation, you will be able to confidently decide the morphology of the fracture into one of these four types based on how they are seen on the CT scan. So let's see four different types of uh, uh, fractures. The most severe is the fracture dislocation. As I told you that in this one vertebral body moves or the spinal column moves in front of the vertebral body, which is injured. So this is translation injury and this translation injury can be sagittal plan can be in coronal plan or axial plan. It's the most severe type of injury. The, the second most severe type of injury is what is called flexion distraction. It used to be called a chance type of fracture. And this is the type of injury where the posterior column failed due to the tension. So it's called tension failure due to distraction because the, 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 the parts get separated from each other, vertically get separated. That is what is distraction force is. Compression forces will bring the part together. So it will result in the collapse of the vertebral body while distraction forces will separate the parts uh, either at the ligamentous level or bony level. And that is what we are going to learn. The third type of fracture, which is the least severe type of fracture, which is called compression injury, and it primarily involves the anterior vertebral body, and it only involves the anterior column. And the fourth type of injury, which is the burst fracture, which is primarily due to axial load and flexion injury, which involves both anterior and middle column of the tennis. So the, in terms of severity, the uh, translation injuries are more severe, then the posterior column, that is a distraction injury, then the burst injuries and the least severe injuries are the wedge compression fractures. So when you are looking at the CT, you can start with the burst injury and then go to the next worst injury, then the bad injury, and then the not so bad injuries, right? So that way you can go ahead or you can go the reverse where you start with the best injuries and then you go to the more severe injury, more severe and the worst injuries. So let's see how to look at it, okay? So first thing is when you have a CT, what I do is that the coronal and sagittal reconstruction, bone windowing, and uh, we look at the 2.5 millimeter section. And first we look for the alignment. And alignment is looked for to diagnose type C injury, which is the translation injury in the AO classification. So how to look for the alignment on the sagittal? By looking at this smooth curved arc type of lines which connects the anterior vertebral body which is called anterior vertebral line the green one is the posterior vertebral line the red one is the spinolaminar line and the last one is the interspinous line so we look at this four line very similar to what we see in cervical spine in terms of alignment on coronal images we look at this lateral vertebral line which connects the lateral part of the vertebral bodies and this will help you to decide whether there is a translation in the coronal plan or not so this is how we look at the Translation injury in a systematic search pattern on a CT. How do we look at the distraction of the posterior column? So distraction of the posterior column involves the posterior vertebral arch. And as you can see it here, so it involves the neural arch. So one is the pedicle, 
Two is the past interarticularis. Three is the superior articular process. Four is the inferior articular process. This is the lamina and this is the spinous process. So any fracture involving any of this three six structures which has a transverse orientation. So if these fractures are horizontally oriented, which can be seen on the sagittal CT or can be seen on a coronal CT, those are the signs of the distraction injury. So distraction injuries can be bony or ligamentous or mixed. When it's a bony injury, any of the six structures of the neural arch can fail because of the transverse fracture because there is a distraction force. What else can happen? Apart from this fracture, the, because of the ligamentous injury, the facet joint capsule ligament when injured, it will result in the diastasis, subluxation or dislocation of the facet joint. And facet joints are seen best on the sagittal or the axial images. The other ligament, when the interspinous or supraspinous ligament is disrupted, that will result in the widening of the interspinous distance. How to look for interspinous distance widening? So suppose this is the index level where you are looking at the widening. What you have to do is that you have to measure the interspinous distance above the level of the index and you have to measure the index, the interspinous distance below the level of the index and then you have to average out. So suppose this is 10, this is 12, average will be 11. So if at the index level, if this is more than 11, that is the sign of an interspinous widening and it is an indirect feature of the posterior ligamentous complex. The third type of injury, which is the wedge compression injury, which involves the anterior column, we look for five signs, which is called sclerotic line parallel to the vertebral end plate. So those sclerotic line are seen somewhere here. Then we look at the depression or the wedging of the vertebral body seen by the loss of height. We look for the deformity of the vertebral end plate and I'll show you the example of it. We look for discontinuity cortical step. How to look for the burst fracture? Burst fracture is the compression fracture of the middle column. Okay. So what you have to do, so whenever there is a burst fracture, the fracture line which was seen adjacent to the vertebral end plate extend to the posterior cortex. So whenever fracture line extend to the posterior cortex, that is the definition of the burst fracture. So this posterior cortical line once extend, you can see on the sagittal image, you can see on the axial image. As you can see here, normally the posterior cortex is very smooth and slightly concave. So when you see loss of this smooth outline or there is loss of this normal concavity sign of a burst factor. When burst factor is severe, you can get two other signs and that one sign is widening of the interpedicular distance. How to measure interpedicular distance? Again, the same rule. If suppose this is the index level, you have to measure the interpedicular level above it and interpedicular distance below it. You average it out and if at the index level, same example 10 and 12, so average is 11. If at the index level, your interpedicular distance is more than 11, it is a sign of an interpedicular distance widening. That is one of the signs of a severe type of burst fracture, which you will learn. And last but not the least, Burst fracture can also involve the neural arch. However, unlike distraction injuries, in burst fracture, the injury which happens in the neural arch has more vertical orientation, unlike in distraction injuries where the orientation of the neural arch fracture is more horizontal. And we are going to see the examples of both of them as we move ahead. So this is about how to look for these injuries on a CT. And now we look at the details. So Four types of injuries, either start from the most severe and go to the least severe, vice versa. So let's start with the least severe type of injury. And that injury is called compression injury. In AO classification, this can, injury has been given grade A1 or A2. So let's see how it looks like. So what we see, the several signs we have to look for is dense sclerotic line. So you can see this nice dense sclerotic line. There is a depression. How to look for the depression? So again, same way, if you look at the vertebral body height below it, and if you see that the vertebral body index level is lower than the vertebral body height below it, it is probably depressed. So that is a depression. Deformity, as you can see, superior end plate is deformed. And you can see that there is a buckling of the cortex and there is a discontinuity of the cortex, as you can see on the, on the axial images, coronal images and sagittal images. Now, you have to remember that one of the characteristic feature of burst fracture, of the, one of the characteristic feature of the compression fracture is that the fracture line does not extend to the posterior cortex. Okay, so the 
line stops somewhere before the posterior cortex is reached. And so use the smooth posterior cortical line on the axial images is preserved. Let's see an example on this video. Okay, so look at this uh, video. So what we are seeing here, is this nice sclerotic line. There is loss of vertebral body height loss. How many levels do you see this sclerotic line? So you can see multiple levels. This vertebral body is abnormal. This vertebral body is abnormal. This vertebral body is abnormal. There is a step here. There is a deformity here. There is a superior end plate compression is there. However, none of these places, this line is extending. You can see that this line does not extend to the posterior cortex. And that is the characteristic features of this compression injury, and these are described as A1 slash A2. The A2 compression injuries will have a vertical split. So if you see a vertical split, which is coronally oriented like this, that will call pincer type of fracture or A2 type of fracture. Again, A2 type of fracture is relatively rare. So most of the injuries, what you see is A1 type of fracture. The second type of injury, what we have to describe is the birth fracture. Birth fracture occur due to axial loading and flexion in different uh, uh, combination. And what does it do is birth fracture will result in compression of the anterior column. And quite often it can result in either compression or distraction of the posterior column. So everything in the spine, the morphology depends upon three things. One is the vector, the force vector. So the force vector, how much magnitude of the force vector, fulcrum of the force vector and the direction of the force vector. So if the fulcrum is in the vertebral body anteriorly, fulcrum is in the central part, fulcrum in the, in the posterior part or fulcrum is much anterior to the vertebral body, with the same magnitude, different morphology of the injury happens. But having said that, burst fracture is where the axial loading injury predominates. The burst fracture is a type of a compression fracture, axial load and, and flexion. 90% of the burst fractures occur in T9 to L5 with more than 50% occur at the thoracolumbar junction. What is the AO definition of burst fracture? Burst fracture is when end plate is fractured plus posterior cortex extension of the fracture is there. Posterior cortex can buckle, can retropulse or just do nothing. So let's see the example. Okay, so in this example, you can see that there is a wedging, compression. So this is a normal vertebral body and this vertebral body height is reduced. There is a cortical step and there is this fracture line, which is this sclerotic line. So there is a A type of injury, compression injury. A1 and A2, if this line does not extend to the posterior cortex. However, in this patient, that this line is extending to the posterior cortex. And as I told you, normally the posterior vertebral body is smooth or slightly concave. However, here you can see that the posterior vertebral cortex is convex, buckled like a pregnant belly appearance. And this is very characteristic feature of a birth fracture. What does AO suggest? AO suggests that you will call something as a birth fracture when end plate is involved. So here in this case, superior end plate is involved plus posterior cortex. So superior end plate plus extension of the fracture to the posterior cortex is enough to classify it into A3, A4. However, once the fracture extends to the posterior cortex, the posterior cortex may buckle, posterior cortex may fragment, posterior cortex may retropulse, a lot of things will happen. And that is where the severity of fracture comes into place, where A3 can be differentiated from A4. When you look at the axial, the burst fracture is a characteristic feature of the communication. So you can see that multiple Vertebral body is not only compressed, there is a communication and this communicated fragments are radially displaced. That's another. I showed you previously the normal posterior vertebral cortex. Here you can see that the posterior cortex is irregular. And this is again a characteristic feature of birth fracture on axial images. Previous years when sagittal images were not available, people used to rely on the axial images to diagnose. Nowadays, we hardly look at the axial images. Sagittal is everything what you need to uh, know will tell you. So burst fracture is the fracture involving vertebral end plate plus posterior cortex. And there is posterior cortex buckling and loss of smooth, uh, smooth posterior cortex. So what are the spectrum of the burst injury? So 
as per AO, as I told you, burst fracture is when either superior or inferior end plate is involved plus posterior cortex is involved. However, there are other features of burst fracture as well, like a compression factor, which I showed you. So vertebral body shows compression, variable type level of compression, fracture extent to the posterior cortex, which you already described, loss of posterior vertebral body height loss. So as you can see in this example on your left, the posterior vertebral body height is not significantly lost. However, in this example, the posterior vertebral body height is significantly lost. So this is where the severity of burst is coming into place and how we differentiate A3 from A4 in AO classification. Then what happens is that I told you that retropulsion of the posterior cortex or posterior cortex buckles. If it's more severe, there is retropulsion. Comminuted fracture with centrifugal displacement. I showed you all the centrifugal displacement. So the best centrifugal displacement will be seen on the axial images. Neural arch can also fracture. However, the when neural arch is fractured, it has a vertical orientation of the fracture, unlike the traction injury, which has more of a horizontal orientation of the fracture. And vertebral body on coronal plan quite often split in sagittal plan. So sagittal split is one of the characteristic features of axial loading, not necessary burst fracture, but burst fracture is a prototype of axial loading. So whenever I see sagittal split in the vertebral body, I know that and sagittal splitting is best seen on coronal images. So when we see the sagittal splitting of the vertebral body, you know that the axial loading has happened. So vertebral body split into two parts, right and left half. And last but not the least, interpedicular distance is widened, which I already explained you how to look for it. Is interpedicular distance above the level of the index, below the level of the index, averages out and widen. Just a practical tip. It's very difficult to measure at two level and then to average out. It's a lot of hard work. So what I do in lumbar spine, as we know that as we go from top to bottom, interpedicular distance normally widens. So if the index level interpedicular distance is wider than the vertebral level below it, it is an indirect or it is one of the signs that interpedicular distance is widened. So you don't have to measure a two level and then to average out because it's not possible in a busy trauma center to go through all of this. So just look at easily the interpedicular distance at the index level, the level below. If it's wider than the level below, it's a sign of a, of a severe burn. So what does burst cause? The burst causes end plate fracture plus posterior cortex extension. End plate fractures, now we come to the, how to differentiate A3 from A4. So if only one end plate is involved, it is A3. If both the end plates are involved, it is A4. And we'll see the example. Of course, it goes to the posterior cortex. It goes to the combination of the fracture with centrifugal dis uh, displacement. Whenever you see interpedicular distance widening and the vertical laminar fracture, which I showed you, they are quite often seen in severe burst and A4 type of burst. And burst fracture can also have a posterior column distraction, which we are going to learn shortly. So let's see an example of how burst fracture looks like. So let's see the images as I can show you here. So you can see that in this patient, there is a loss of height of this vertebral body, as you can see it here. Okay, the anterior cortex has buckled here. The fracture is involving the superior end plate and the vertebral body, and you can see that compared to the vertebral body above, vertebral body uh, below. Okay, now we'll go more coronally, and here you can see that this fracture line is not only extending to the posterior cortex. There is a So as I told you, on, on sagittal images, your posterior cortex should be smooth straight line or slightly concave line like this. Whenever you see this pregnant belly like buckling of this, so what I tell my resident, if you see like distal radius torus fracture like fracture of the posterior cortex of the vertebrae, that is the sign of a burst fracture. So this is one of the mild type of burst fracture. As you can see here, the inferior plate is paired. So this fracture is only involving the superior end plate. This is an example of A3 type of a burst fracture. Let's see how it looks on the coronal. So as you can see on the coronal images, the fracture is involving the superior end plate. Fracture is involving the posterior cortex, which is not very well seen. The interpedicular distance at the index level is not wider than the interpedicular distance below it, and there is no vertical laminar fracture. So this is a very classic example of a mild type of burst fracture, 
on axial, when you look at this, you will see this nice smooth posterior cortex at non-fracture level compared to the at the level of fracture where you see this posterior cortex as zigzaggy and irregular with all this centrifugal displacement of the combinated vertebral fractures. This is another example of a more severe type of a burst fracture. You can see that there is a significant loss of vertebral body height. Superior end plate is involved. The fracture is extending to the posterior cortex. The posterior cortex is also broken and there is this buckling or the torus-like deformity of the posterior cortex. I'm going more vertically down and now at this level you can see that the fracture is also involving the inferior cortex and the posterior vertebral body height is also lost. So what are the characteristic feature of A4 type of a burst fracture in AO classification? Few findings. First of all, it involves both the vertebral end plate. How to look for both vertebral end plate involvement? The best is to look on the coronal. So when you go coronal, you will see that the both vertebral end plate, you will see this through and through fracture here. So that is the involvement of both superior and inferior vertebral end plate. You will see that the posterior vertebral body height will be lost compared to the A3 vertebral, A3 type of burst where the posterior vertebral height is reduced or of a normal or slightly reduced. However, here you see a significant loss of posterior vertebral body height loss. There will be a significant retropulsion. And when you look at the posterior column, you will see the interpedicular distance widening as well as the widening as well as the vertical laminar fracture. So let's see what are the signs what you saw. So this was a fracture which was extending the posterior cortex. So it is at least burst, at least A3. There was retropulsion. There was this combination and axial uh, uh, plan with centrifugal distribution. Posterior vertebral height was lost. Then the fracture was extending the posterior cortex. And then you can see that both superior and inferior end plates were involved. So burst is not a single fracture. Though Tillich says burst as two points and single fracture, AO says that burst is A3 and A4. But even A3 has a spectrum, even A4 has a spectrum. The burst can be can be said as stable versus unstable, incomplete versus complete, mild versus severe. In Tillich, it is just burst. In AO, it's A3 and A4. And in AO, the burst has a third component, which is called burst with PLC plus, which you will learn a little bit later how to look at it. So in A3, only single end plate is involved with posterior wall. In A4, both end plate, vertical laminar fracture, interpedicular widening. Though interpedicular widening and vertical laminar fractures are not uh, the described findings in A4. So AO says that if both end plates are involved, you call it A4. However, whenever there is a A4, you will invariably see vertical laminar fracture and interpedicular widening. So let's see an example. So the example on your left shows a mild birth. How do you know that? So because fracture is extending to one end plate and posterior end plate, as I said, there is some posterior height loss, but not significant compared to compared to that of the vertical above. However, you can see the severe birth, both end plate, the superior and inferior end plates are involved. There is a significant loss of posterior height. There is a significant retropulsion. When you do the coronal, you will see the superior and inferior end plate extension. When you look at it, you will see the widening of the interpedicular distance. As I told you, the interpedicular distance at the index level is wider than the level below. It is a sign of a widening. And then you see this vertical laminar fracture, which is a sign of an A4. So now we are clear how to differentiate A3 from A4. So burst again has multiple phases, single versus both vertebral end plate. Uh, posterior vertebral height loss variable, more retropulsion, more combination, posterior column involvement, particular widening. So this is what is described as vertical laminar fracture. It is one of the characteristic features of the burst. What does it signify? It suggests that this burst fracture is severe. There is a possibility of a dural tear because this dura might pinch inside this, this uh, 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 the fracture. However, you have to remember that whenever you see this vertical laminar fracture, don't call this birth fracture as a three-column fracture. It doesn't make it a three-column. Three-column fractures are the more severe fracture in terms of instability. However, in this patient with vertical laminar fracture, the posterior column has failed in compression. When posterior column fails in the distraction, when the tensile failure occurs, that is the time you call it a three-column fracture. However, this becomes more of a three-column injury, but it is not as unstable injury as we will learn in the three-column injury, okay? So this does not automatically see a lot of reports of radiology, different places where they say that burst fracture with posterior column fracture, so it's a three-column, very highly unstable injury, which is a wrong way of putting it in. 
Burst fractures are operated primarily not because they are unstable, primarily because they cause neurological instability. And we'll learn a little bit later on in our session. Okay, so what to report when there is a burst fracture? First of all, call it a burst fracture, at least A3. How to call it? End plate plus posterior cortex. Then you describe how comminuted the fracture is, how retropulsed the posterior cortex is, how much is the central canal compromised, how much fragments are displaced, whether the fragments are rotated or not. And we'll just see an example of reverse cortical sign and what is happening to the posterior ligamentous complex. So this is what is called reverse cortical sign. And what has happened is that this fragment has, so this is an A4 type of burst fracture. And this fragment has gone inside the spinal canal caused significant spinal canal stenosis. However, this fragment has rotated 180 degree. So the cortex is in the front which should be on the posterior part and the trabecular bone is behind. So this is a sign of a reverse cortical sign. Extremely important sign to mention in a burst fracture. It suggests posterior ligamentous disruption, PLL, posterior longitudinal ligament disruption. This patient needs to be approached by the anterior approach decompression. Corpectomy needs to be done and cage and graft needs to be put in this patient, unlike the other birth fracture, which can potentially be treated from the posterior approach as well. Again, we will leave this to the spine trauma team, how to do that. Okay, look at this. This is how the fra fracture is retropulsed, but the posterior cortex is still posterior. So you can see that the posterior cortex is still posterior. This is normal. However, here you can see that the posterior cortex, what you see this zagat margin and the here is the cortex. So this is called reverse. So this is flipped 180 degree, a very important sign to describe in your report about reverse cortical sign. It has a lot of surgical implications. Burst can also occur with posterior column distraction. So, so far I showed you vertical laminar fracture, which was an injury of the compression injury. However, burst can also have a posterior ligament complex Injury, as you can see here, anteriorly burst, but posteriorly you can see that the facet joints are widened. There's a transverse fracture through the spinous process. So these are the hybrid type of burst, and that we will learn more in the fracture dislocation, uh, in the in the fracture uh, distraction, the chance type of fracture. Okay. So what 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 have we learned about burst? Burst is not a single type of fracture, as Tilix mentioned. Burst is a heterogeneous group of injuries. Even AO could not categorize into more than two types because A3 is a spectrum, A4 is a spectrum. Burst is commonly considered as a mechanically unstable. However, it's not always the case. Burst is burst is treated not because it's unstable, but primarily because it causes the neural the spinal canal compromise. And there is another classification for burst fracture, which is important if you are seeing a lot of, if you are working with a lot of spine trauma people, you should be learning about this load sharing score, which we are not going to discuss today. And central Compromise, canal compromise is a dynamic process uh, and not a static process. How bursts are managed, okay? So the bursts can be divided basically into two types. Burst with neurology, they are by and large surgically treated. Our burst without neurology, A4, severe A4 are treated surgically quite often. A3 are often treated non-surgically. A4 with reverse cortical sign is invariably treated surgically with the anterior approach. When there is a significant spinal canal compromise, some surgeons treat uh, this even without neurology. A4 with B injury, any posterior ligamentous complex distraction are unstable spine and those patients are treated uh, uh, with the surgically. And kyphosis or progressive kyphosis on, on follow-up imaging, these patients are treated. So these are the, the signs which I described. Uh, these signs are the signs of mechanical instability uh, while neurological, whenever it's present, they need to be. So... What is, the, what is the important thing to learn? That each injury morphology is not black and white. It is a spectrum of injury and spectrum of severity. A3 is a spectrum. A4 is a spectrum. Describe them rather than just giving them a name. Okay, So give them a name at the end, but describe them well in the body of your report. The third type of injury, which is now we are moving to the more unstable injury, which is called the flexion distraction injury, which are given B1 and B2 in the AO classification. So basically, distraction injury will separate the spinal column vertically. So bones or ligaments will move away from each other, tearing them apart. 
as I told you, because of the biomechanics, most of the time the tension failure occurs in the posterior compartment. And quite often this posterior compartment tension failure is associated with the compression injury of the anterior compartment. So what you will see is anterior compartment has A type of injury and posterior compartment has B type of injury. And we are going to see it. So flexion distraction are called chance or chance-like fracture, seat belt fracture, posterior column fails in distraction, anterior middle column fails in flexion. 50% of chance or chance-like fracture occurs at thoracolumbar junction and almost one third to one half of the fractures have associated intra-abdominal injury. Now you have to remember that the chance described this fracture in 1948, much before the CT and his paper in British Journal of Radiology is consists of one and a half page, only three injuries. And he said that these are the pure bony injuries However, there were no CT scan or MRI available to say that what he told was actually bony injury or ligamentous injury. Because quite often in real life, we see very rarely pure bony chance, which are B1 injuries. So majority of real life chance injuries are B2 injuries, which are ligamentous injury or mixed injury. And that is why they are called chance-like fractures or chance variants. So posterior tension bed failure, which is the AO type B, can occur through the bone, which is a transverse fracture of the posterior elements, which is called B1, or it happens through the ligament, which is called B2, or it involves both bones and ligament, in which case it's also called B2. So either pure ligamentous or bony plus ligamentous is called B2, while pure osseous injuries are called B1, which are extremely rare or relatively rare. There is one M1 modifier in AO classification, and same way, there is a modifier in TLIX as well, where we are not sure, even after doing a CT, even after doing an MR, if you are not sure whether the PLC is injured or not, you call it indeterminate PLC or M1 modifier. So just put M1. We'll learn how to do that. Anterior injury can be wedging or burst, any type of A1, A2, A3, or A4. The posterior tension bend injury, when there is a bony chance, CT is better than MR. For ligamentous chance, my personal preference, I prefer to look at the CT for ligamentous injury and we will see how to look on the CT for ligamentous injury. MRI, you can directly see the ligaments. However, quite often you see edema, which makes it indeterminate. So my personal preference is CT is better than MRI in describing the ligamentous injury of the posterior ligamentous complex. MRI will overestimate the ligamentous injury. So the edema is not equivalent to ligamentous disruption. So B1, the bony, is monosegmental injury. It involves single segment. B2 is mixed or ligamentous injury is involved two adjacent segments. And anterior posterior injuries can act at a different level. So how to look for this? So on fractures, you have to look for horizontal fractures of the neural arch. For ligament, what are the signs of the posterior ligamentous complex injury? If you see a local kyphosis more than 40, if you see regional kyphosis more than 25, Passet joint diastasis, subluxation to location, increased interspinal distance, or if you see MRI, edema, fluid, and discontinuity. Let's see all of this one by one. So first of all, how to measure the, the, the regional kyphosis. So regional kyphosis is measured. If this is the index vertebrae, you go to the one vertebral level above superior end plate and one vertebral level below inferior end plate and you measure the angle between these two, which is called Cobb's angle. If this Cobb's angle is more than 25, it is an indirect evidence that this can happen only if the posterior ligaments are distracted. Let's see the example. So you can see that there is a significant, the, the regional kyphotic angle is more than 25 degree. So even if this looks like a burst, this happens only when the posterior ligaments are distracted and there is a PLC injury. Same way you can see that there is a vertebral body height loss. So vertebral body height loss of more than 40% in a patient with normal bone density. So I think this is very, very important thing to know that all of these signs are useful when the bone density is normal. So these rules do not apply to osteoporotic compression fractures in which you can have a much worse kyphotic angle with preserved posterior complex or much worse loss of height with preserved posterior complex. However, in young patient with MVC, if you will see the local kyphotic angle, uh, regional kyphotic angle of more than 25, or if you see the vertebral body height loss of more than 40 degrees, that is a sign of a severe posterior ligamentous complex indirect injury. This is the local kyphotic angle, how to measure it? from the superior vertebral end plate to inferior vertebral end plate, if this angle is more than 40 degree, that is a sign of a, 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 a posterior ligamentous complex. 
look at some of the signs. What are the other signs? We look at for the interspinous distance widening. Again, interspinous distance at the index level is wider than the average of the above and below. And same way, if you see any horizontal fracture of the neural arch, as you can see in this patient, horizontal fracture of the pars intraarticularis, horizontal fracture through the lamina, horizontal fracture of the, inter, the, the spinous process and widening of the interspinous ligament. Facet joint diastasis, as you can see in this patient, uh, is a sign of facet joint subluxation is a sign, facet joint dislocation is a sign of this, and any horizontal fracture to the posterior column is a sign of a posterior ligamentous injury. So when you are reporting, what to report? First of all, mention whether it's a bony, which is a single level, or B2 mixed with adjacent level. CT, the fracture, you look for the fracture and the displacement. MRI, you look for edema, fluid, or discontinuity. If you are not sure, add M1. And always describe the vertebral body wedging or burst described separately in AO81 to A4, and we'll see some of the examples. So let's see two examples uh, 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 in this patient. So what's happening in this patient? So as you can see here, this patient has a significant loss of vertebral body height. Anterior vertebral body height loss is more than 40%. If I measure a kyphotic angle, it will be more than 25 degree. That is a sign of a posterior column destruction. You can see the superior vertebral end plate has a fracture which is extended to the posterior cortex. So that will make it A3, which is this vertebral body. This vertebral body is L1. So you describe L1, then A3. So that means L1 vertebral body has A3 type of a fracture. You go behind what you see here, you can see that there is a significant widening of the interspinous distance. What you do next, you go and you can see that there is a transverse fracture through the pedicle and the posterior element. So there is a B1 component, bony component, there is a ligamentous component, so it's a mixed component, it will go to B2. Let's look at the coronal. What's happening in the coronal, anteriorly you will see that there is an A3 type of a fracture of the of the uh, uh, of the vertebral body and as you go behind you can see transverse fracture through the pedicle lamina and there is a distraction and there is an interspinous widening so this level is called the t12 l1 so what you write in ao classification you write t12 l1 p2 and then you say l1 a3 so this is how the final report of you will look like if you are using a AO classification. Otherwise, you will just say that there is a distraction injury at T12 L1 with bony and ligamentous component, and there is a burst fracture predominantly involving the superior end plate without significant retropulsion, suggestive of a mild burst fracture. Whatever way it works with your spine surgeons, if they are using AO classification, this is what you write. So B2 fracture is always adjacent level. B1 fracture or A fracture is monoosteotic single level. I hope this is clear. So again, look at the same example, interspinous widening, transverse fracture to the posterior column, transverse fracture to the posterior column, anterior, there is a wide, uh, significant loss of height, kyphotic angle is more than 25, again, transverse fracture to the posterior column on the coronal, transverse fracture to the posterior column, transverse fracture, and widening of the interspinous distance. So that is what you'll say. So each injury morphology has a spectrum of severity, and goal is to describe them rather than to name them. And remember that you can have more than one type of injury present. So reporting tips is that injury morphology are often mixed. More than one injury morphology is quite frequent. When there are combined mechanisms, each injury should be classified separately with more severe injury written first. So in the previous case, B is more severe than the A. So write about the B first and then the A. If multiple level of injuries are involved, different level, each level injury is assessed independently and separately. And telix. So in telix, if more than one injury is present, the single injury with the largest score is used. So in previous patient, what you will say, distraction injury and PLC plus. Okay, so three points for distraction injury and three points for uh, uh, PLC plus, so six points. In AO, you will write exactly what we say, T12, L1, B2, and then T and L1 as A3. So that is what you do in the AO. So this is another example, probably will not go through it. Uh, it's a very similar example, what I showed you. Last type of fracture pattern is fracture dislocation or the translation type of injury, which is the most severe injury. It is described as AO type C. And in, in Telix also, it is described as one of the worst injuries. What happens, the one vertebral level, vertebrae, entirely as a column move in front of the other. So you can see that there is a translation of this vertebral body over the anterior translation of more than 50% here. So this is the fracture dislocation, C type of fracture on sagittal plan, 
Here there is a coronal plan translation and here there is an axial plan translation. So these are the different types of translation injuries, some of the most severe type of injury. What are the other features which will always be there in fracture dislocation? So you will have either a facet joint dislocation or path fracture or facet articular facet fracture. Posterior column quite often distracted and ALL and PLL have quite often a stripping type of injury. So all of these are one of the severe most type of injury you will see in your day-to-day -day life. So there is a path fracture or uh, or the superior interarticular facet fracture and ALL and PLL stripping or the aversion injuries are there. So multi-ligamentous, multi-segmental, it's a very severe injury. Most of these patients have a severe neurology as well. Now, my residents quite often, like I tell them that translation pitfall is not, so don't mistake the retropulsion with the translation. So you can see in this example, this vertebral body is fractured and it is moving back side. So it looks like this vertebral body has moved in front of this vertebral body. So quite often when you start interpreting, you call it entrolysthesis of 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, L, T12 over L1. However, if you ignore the injured vertebra and draw the smooth curve, you can see that the T12 and L2 vertebral body are normally aligned. And only the L1 vertebral body has retropulse. So this is retropulsion, which is not equivalent to translation. Retropulsion is less severe injury compared to translation. In translation, what should happen? Ignore the vertebral body which is injured. Draw a line below the vert vertebral injured vertebral body and draw a line above the injured vertebral body and see whether the spinal column above the injured and below the injured, ignoring the injured vertebral body are aligned or not. Then that is a sign of a translation injury. So retropulsion is not retrolysis. Quite often when retropulsion is there, it looks like this vertebral body has moved in front of others, but that is not the case. So when to do an MRI? MRI is done with any spine trauma who has a positive neurology. In the absence of neurology, when do we do MRI? Translation injuries, which is very unlikely because translation injuries will invariably have a neurology. If you see any distraction injury on CT, we invariably do MRI, so both B1 and B2. When you see severe compression injury, A4, we usually, we usually do the MRI to upgrade it to the PLC, of which will be B grade. And all patients who are going for surgery, we invariably do PRs, uh, the, uh, we invariably do the MRI. What we look for in MRI, we look for the spinal canal. The spinal canal should have the nerves and the CSF. Anything other than that, so if you see the bone inside the spinal canal, if you see blood in the, inside the spinal canal, that's abnormal. Corda cord or nerve root compressed is abnormal. If cord is compressed and if it shows abnormal signal, that's also abnormal. We look for the ligaments on the spine, uh, uh, MRI and ligaments can have edema, discontinuity of fluid. And as I told you that the CT is far better than MR, looking for the bony injuries. It is quite good for ligamentous injury as well. And presence of edema is not equivalent to ligament injury. So MRI quite often does not contribute that much or MRI quite overestimates the injury. And so uh, 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 you have to take the MRI finding with a pinch of salt. And MRI can show you the disc injury. So look at the example. So this is a nice example of normal posterior ligament complex. So this is very useful MRI. If you are not sure on the CT or PLC and you do an MRI, and MRI shows this jet black type of posterior ligamentous complex, I'm very sure that these ligaments are normal. If I see edema on the posterior ligament, it doesn't take me anywhere. It goes to the indeterminate. In TLX, I say 0.2, two points, that's indeterminate. In AO, I say M1 modifier, indeterminate. If I see fluid, that is a sign that this ligament is injured. If I don't see a ligament where I should be seeing it's a sign of an injury, that makes it a ligamentous injury. You can see that multi-ligamentous injury in this translation type of fracture with disc injury as well. So I think approach to MRI in a spine injury is a different topic altogether and probably hopefully sometime later we'll do a a separate uh, session on how to approach a systematic search pattern of MRI in spine trauma. Uh, but today, my main concern was the CT scan, and that is what we did. So what we do at the end of uh, the, uh, your uh, presentation, my presentation, CT, look for it. First, look for the sagittal coronal axial plan for listhesis. If the listhesis is present, it's a type C factor, fracture dislocation. If alignment is normal, look for the posterior column distraction. Present, then it's B type of fracture. Decide whether B1 or B2. No distraction, look for the look for the retropulsion or the involvement of the posterior cortex. If it's present, it will make it burst, which is A3, A4. 
And if it's absent, it makes it A1, A2. The take-home points are systematic search pattern and checklist-based approach to detect, describe, and differentiate different type of fractures. Each morphology has a spectrum of severity. Describe it well before you name it. Understand that which CT features will predict PLC injuries, including kyphosis, including vertebral body height loss, including the, the posterior neural arch fractures and the widening of the distances. Understand when to use CT. So CT is used pretty much in every high velocity injury patients um, as a first line imaging. MRI used when there is a neurology, uh, neurologically patient is unstable, when the ligaments are suspected to be injured or as a problem solver. Radiographs are used as a screening in low risk patient, low velocity injury, and they are used quite often as a post of follow up to look for the worsening of the kyphosis. Uh, I recommend all of you to go through my paper, um, uh, our paper in 2016 um, uh, about thoracolumbar spine injury and all of these uh, principles are described as well. And I would be happy to take the questions. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Reniga, for that awesome lecture. Appreciate it Great. so much. Thank we you. will open the floor to questions now. So if you've got those, please place them in that Q&A okay. feature. Uh, do you have CT? Okay. Do you have CT examples of fractures? I think uh, I have already shown the examples of fractures, right? Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, well, I don't see much of the presentation. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of compliments. Okay. <laughs> yeah, they're just the compliments. Okay. Uh, okay. So there's one question. No history or prior images. Can you share features to differentiate acute versus chronic compression fractures? No MRI available. Uh, uh, well, this was honestly not uh, the the uh, goal of my presentation. So I did not describe it so well, but uh, there are well-described features to differentiate acute for chronic compression fractures. But most of those fractures occur in an osteoporotic uh, uh, setting, low velocity, low risk type of patient. So uh, we start with x-rays and then on x-ray, we look for uh, uh, the, the sharp definition of the vertebral end plates. If I see all the vertebral end plates really clearly, um, uh, uh, usually those are the chronic fractures. If you are not sure, MRI is something which is a problem solver in this type of patient. So quite often, if patients have acute pain uh, and fall, and if I'm not sure. So when I look at the radiographs, I describe my findings in three ways. Sometimes I'm quite sure this is a remote or old fracture. Sometimes I'm quite sure this is an acute fracture. And sometimes I'm not sure. I just call it indeterminate and we do an MRI. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Swaroop. Uh, yeah. Okay, uh, no history, no prize. Okay, fine. So I think I'm just looking at, um, okay, a disc uh, spondylitis, uh, how can we diagnose it? Well, again, uh, uh, this was not for spondylitis uh, or the disc uh, uh, infection. So probably uh, we'll, we'll keep it some other day. Um, I think why Telix gives three points to translation if it's more severe than the disc? Yeah, I think they, they are a little bit, uh, I, I, I completely agree. So Felix has added that uh, additional uh, injury morphology, which they call it rotation. And this translation and rotations are not very easy to differentiate on morphology. And that is where Telix has poor inter and intra observer reliability. So Telix has this problem, particularly in this 0.3 and 0.4, the which to call translation and which to call rotation. And they say rotation is worse than translation. However, the AO has removed that part completely. And as we now know that most of the translation have rotation component. So quite often you have compression injuries, which are A type of injury, distraction injuries, which are B type of injury. And then you have translation rotation. So that's where AO made it a little simplified to make it slightly better reliable classification. But I completely agree with you. I struggle to put three versus four, when to call it rotation and when to call it a, a translation. I, I, I'm i with you like, so, uh, so they, that, that's the problem with the Tulix. Would kyphoplasty or vertioplasty be advised in patients having such injuries or screws or spine? Uh, well, that's a very good question. And <clears throat> the people have tried using kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty in some of the mild birth fracture with pain and some of the even severe birth fracture also. But as far as uh, it is still more of an experimental, majority of the centers still do 
some form of spinal instrumentation, if at all surgical intervention needs to be done. And majority of the center still uses the posterior instrumentation with or without fusion. Um, uh, and some, sometimes they use anterior or mixed type of it, but I agree with you, people have started doing kyphoplasty for even traumatic uh, uh, compression fractures as well. Yes, but it's still not, the, the literature is not uh, 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 in, a, in a huge quantity um, or, or probably uh, I haven't come across, but uh, I agree with uh, you that, uh, that people have started doing that. Causes of stir hyperintensity. Okay, how to differentiate causes of stir hyperintensity and end plate due to modic changes of fracture? Uh, uh, well, uh, that is uh, so quite often the anterior end plate fractures, I'm very sure, on the CT scan, and it will be a bit of a challenge uh, to differentiate. If the patient had modic type one changes um, um, and at the same time trauma to differentiate it confidently all the time. Having said that the modic type changes occurs more uh, in the central end plate with the anterior cortex and the superior end plate anteriorly posterior intact. So if the CT scan shows the fracture which involves the anterior corner or entero superior corner, uh, those are more likely to be related to the fracture. So I told you density, dis, uh, depression, uh, discontinuity, all those five Ds. If those five Ds are there, probably that is the sign that this was a compression fracture. And uh, 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 But I, honestly, I haven't come across a patient who had a modic type 1 change and fracture at the same level, and, and, and we, we, we had this issue to differentiate. Posterior tension bend. Can you please repeat the component anatomy wise and where it is relevant? So the tension bend has two component. One is called posterior tension bend, which is everything behind the posterior ligamentous injury. Posterior tension, posterior ligamentous complex, posterior lig longitudinal ligament. The posterior tension bend has two components. The bony component, which is a neural arch, which includes pedicle, pass intraarticularis, superior articular facet, inferior articular facet, lamina, and spinous processes and transverse processes. Neural arch plus posterior longitudinal posterior ligament complex, PLC, together makes the posterior tension bend. So these ligaments include facet joint capsule, interspinous ligament, supraspinous ligament, and the, uh, the ligamentum flavum. So this four ligament and this seven neural arch component together, 11 things together, makes the posterior tension bend. The posterior tension bend is important because, because of the spine biomechanics. Quite often it happens that the anterior column fails in compression while the posterior column opens up in distraction. And so when posterior tension bend is injured, they are described as type B injuries in AO. And those are the severe unstable injuries. And quite often this patient undergoes the surgical intervention. Whether you call it retroesthesis or Entrolysis. That's a good question. So spine is the only place where we describe the movement of the proximal spine in relation to the distal spine. I don't call so so if 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 a spine has if L3 has moved in front of L4, I call it entrolysis of L3 over L4 rather than retrolysis of L4 over L5, L4 over L3. So Unlike rest of the extremity, so in extremity fractures and dislocation, the displacement of the distal part is described in relation to the proximal part. However, traditionally in spine, the displacement of the proximal part is described in relation to the, the distal part. That's number one. When a single vertebral body is collapsed and moves inside the spinal canal, I don't call it retrolysthesis, I call it retropulsion. So, that's just the word to describe it. But when I say retropulsion, I know that I'm describing just the movement of the injured vertebral body rather than the movement of the entire spine. So retrolithesis and entrolithesis when the entire spinal column moves in relation to the spinal column below. While if only injured level is moving, we call it retropulsion. That makes it easier and at the end of the day, you have to talk with your spine surgeons and what their understanding is and try to tailor your report based on that and their understanding. And you try to make sure that what you understand is exactly what you understand. Uh, when you call it, okay, where, uh, okay, thank you. Oh, uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, 
do you mention the percentage of vertebral body height loss in compression factor? Yes, we do. So, so how do how do we do it? So anterior vertebral height loss. What I do is that anterior vertebral height loss at the index level compared to the anterior vertebral height level above, below, and average. So, for example, if the level above is 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 twenty, level below is thirty, average of both of them is twenty five. And if my index level is suppose 10, so 10 in a percentage of 25 is whatever percentage loss of height I just calculated. Sometimes it's eyeballing, as I told you in a busy trauma center, you may not have time to look at this. So you basically know what constitutes around 40%. So basically anything you describe above 40% doesn't make a big sense. So two things to look for. First is whether the bone density is normal or not. If bone density is normal, any vertebral body height loss more than 40% is slightly less than half, like slightly less than half, more than 40% is a sign that the posterior column must be distracted. So that means that when anterior vertebral body is compressed, you will imply that most likely the posterior ligament complex is distracted or injured and there is a tensile failure. So yes, we do that uh, in, in our report. With continuity to above question, this, this is always described vertebra above with vertebra, but if the index fracture body is considered, the nomenclature would change. So yes, as I told you, we say retropulsion, not to create confusion with retrolysthesis or enterolysthesis. And how do you differentiate between PLL disruption versus PLL lifting? No, uh, okay. So that's a very good question. Uh, uh, in other than fracture dislocation, PLLs are very uncommonly disrupted ligaments. Uh, they are uh, one of the very strong ligaments. Uh, most of the time, PLL as a stripping from the vertebral body. So as I told you that MRI search pattern is a different topic altogether. And today I did not have enough time to concentrate on what to look for in MRI, but uh, Hopefully, we'll do it sometime later. However, having said that, majority of the patient with anterior compression injury, you will see that the PLL view will see in continuity, but that is stripped off from the posterior vertebral cortex, except for the translation injuries where you will see that there is a discontinuity of the PLL. Uh, the second thing is I told you about the reverse cortical sign, which I described in the in the birth factor. And they say that when you see that reverse cortical sign, that's an indirect evidence of PLL discontinuity. So that's a very important uh, sign to describe. Uh, and quite often, you will not see this PLL discontinuity even on MRI. So reverse cortical sign is the only sign which will be present, which will tell you that there is possible PLL disruption. Okay, in your system, the gold standard for classification, uh, 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 well, that's a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, no. Uh, none of the classification is 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 better than the other classification system. It all depends upon how you unify your language and communicate your finding to your surgeon. So at the end of the day, you have to understand how much your surgeons understand this, this classification. So if your surgeon is using a particular classification, for example, t -Lix or AO, then you try to use those classification system. Having said that, more and more people are moving towards using AO t -Lix. So as I told you, 2013 uh, modification of AO, which is given by the same group which gave the t in 2005, so this 2013, it is called AO TLIX classification. And I think that is probably currently available classification system. It is the best available system. However, it all depends upon, uh, so many places in North America, they have started using AO system. The hospital where I work, they don't use the AO classification. So I, I try to describe my findings based on if this was an AO classification, how I would have described that without ultimately giving that numbers like T12L1, B2, and then TL1, B3, and A3, and things like that. I don't give those numbers, but then I put in description what exactly that mean uh, by putting it. So places where they use the AO classification system in structured report and impression, 
at the impression, they just put like this, T12, L1, B2, L1, A3, and that's it. Everyone understand. And then if there is a modifier, they put M1. So the, the, the spine surgeons understand, but if your trauma surgeons do not use it, uh, they are not using it, then probably better not to uh, give them this uh, uh, numbers uh, and don't confuse them. Then in that case, give them more description, sit with them and, and tell them what they are looking for and try to answer this question. Yeah. And um, putting it simply, injury of PLC is a distraction. Absolutely. This is exactly the simplest way of putting it is that injury of PLC is distraction injury. Our distraction injury has three components. One is pure bony, which used to be called chance. Bony plus ligamentous, which is mixed. Or pure ligamentous, which is B2. So pure ligamentous B2 and bone plus ligamentous B2 are called the distraction injury or the PLC injury or the tension or the tension band failure. All of this are synonym. Having said that, I must tell you that B1 injury is what Chance described, which we are not sure whether he actually described B1 or not, but we are presuming that he described B1 based on the x-rays available that time and only three patients. So we say that in our real life, I hardly ever see a B1 fracture. All of my B1 fractures are actually B2 fractures. So they, are, they have always have ligamentous component, very rarely pure B1 fractures. So, uh, but what you are understanding is correct, but it can have a bony component also. Okay, thank you, Yasser. Thank you. Uh, retropulsion on cranial epidural sec, how you assess the prognosis? Well, again, as I told you uh, that retropulsion you have to say how much is the retropulsion and what this retropulsion is causing to the spinal canal so what you have to say that while moderate severe if you can if you can arbitrarily divide that retropulsion or you say that with retropulsion with spinal canal compromise less than 50 percent or more than 50 percent or you say that minimum spinal canal ap diameter is this much so either way you put it, either you put it at percentage based on the spinal canal diameter level above and level below, or you say that spinal canal diameter is reduced by approximately this much percentage, or you say that the minimum spinal canal diameter at the level of the worst retropulsion is this much. Now, at this point, I must tell you that retropulsion, what you see in image is not the actual retropulsion which happened at the time of trauma, right? The actual retropulsion which happened at the time of trauma is quite often much worse than what you see on images. And then there is an elastic recoil of the tissues and this retropulse fragment comes back. They recede. And so the retropulsion, what you see on images quite often underestimates the actual retropulsion which you will see on, uh, uh, which happened at the time of the fracture. So you will see that some patients have mild retropulsion and those patients have neurology positive, and some patients have moderate to severe retropulsion without neurology. Simply because retropulsion, what you see is not a static, but it's a dynamic, and we will never be able to tell how much was the retropulsion which happened at the time of injury before the elastic recoil of the tissues take in. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, I think, uh, 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 Okay, there's one more. Could you please explain how to measure the percentage of height loss in multi-level adjacent compression fracture in trauma for each level? Should we use the average? Yes, so that, that's a bit of a, a, a problem. So what we are trying to do is that if you have a multiple contiguous level fractures who are, which, are, uh, which are involved, in that case, the height loss measurement will be a bit of a challenge, in which case you have Two, prob two, two things what you can do is you can go one level above the level. So like suppose if three contiguous levels are involved, then you go one level above the two, three levels and one level below that three levels. So suppose L1, 2, and 3 are involved, you go to T12 and L4 and try to figure out what is the percentage loss height of L1, L2, and L3. It's a bit of a, a, a erroneous result, but uh, uh, those cases are 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 are, are are not one of the like uh, straightforward cases. But having said that, this, this things happen quite often that compression fractures occur at multiple adjacent levels. However, the eyeballing is sometimes quite useful and you will know that what constitutes 40% and what doesn't. Now, having said all of these things, let me tell you one thing, the height loss was more important when the CT was not there. The height loss was primarily described for plain radiographs. So 
once CT came, you are going to see the indirect evidence of the posterior ligament complex injuries like fractures or widening of the interspinous ligament or the widening of the facet joint capsule or other findings. So in that case, height loss is not that much of a problem. Uh, 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 this was made of an issue in radiographs. So we use primarily height loss when we are describing the radiographs rather than the CT because CT are going to see the indirect evidence of uh, the direct evidence of the height loss um, or the kyphotic deformity, which is the posterior ligament complex. Dr. Rinig, okay. I think you got them all. <laughs> Yeah, uh, transaction can be assessed by CT. No, we cannot assess the transaction by CT. MR needs to be done. Yeah, thank you. So we are almost there. Yeah, thank you so much. Amazing. All of you. Thank, thank you, Ashley. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you for the lecture and for being so gracious with your time answering those questions. We appreciate it. Thank you. The learners Pleasure. appreciate it. Um, for everyone else participating, thank you so much for all your fantastic questions and for being here. You can access the recording of today's conference and all our previous Noom conferences by creating a free MRI online account. You'll also receive a recording of this in your email if you registered for today's Noom conference. Be sure to join us next week on Thursday, March 28th at 12 p.m. Eastern, where Dr. Atish Zahir will deliver a lecture entitled Cystic Lesions of the Pancreas. You can register for that at MRIOnline.com. Follow us on social media for updates on future Noom conferences. Thanks again and have a great day.